Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. And a great way to kick off with uh, Kosturi. I'm sorry that Michael hasn't made it, but I, I believe he has a certain amount of Kosturi at home to catch up on. And maybe we'll see him later. Uh, are we are we ready to go? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Ready to go. Okay. Um, well, uh, you have got a wonderful array. I have a a, a cup of pure, pure tea, but nonetheless, <laughs> can't have everything. So the Kosturi family, if we go back a couple of generations, we have um, a chap called Leon Kosh, and he had three children, at least three who matter in terms of inheritance. Um, there's Georges Kosh, who is father, uh, late father of Jean-Francois, and then Jean-Francois's son, Raphael, now in charge. But there's also, uh, Georges Kosh had an elder brother called Julien, whose son, Alain, um, had a business called Dwayne Koch de Boer, and then um, Koch Bizois, and now it's in his son Fabien's hands, Dwayne Fabien Koch, who makes some pretty nice wines in Merceau, mostly at village level. And uh, Leon Koch also had a daughter called Marthe, and Marthe had a daughter called Genevieve, Genevieve and uh, she married a guy called Guy Rouleau, and so uh, she is, um, uh, they are um, parents of Jean-Marc Rouleau. So, in fact, Jean-Marc Rouleau is um, a great-grandson of Léon Koch, as indeed is Raphael koch -Dury. So that's uh, the usual intricate way of doing things in the uh, everybody marries everybody else and brings their vineyards in. So Léon Koch didn't have that many vineyards, but his son George added quite considerably um, to the holdings. He took over in 1964, but he had problems with his back. And as early as 1973, uh, Jean-Francois Koch, uh, now Koch Dury, because he married a lady called Odile Dury. Uh, so Jean-Francois Koch Dury took over in 1973, and it's he who really built the incredible uh, reputation of the domain. And when I first visited in 1981, um, the first two people I went to see were the Domaine des Complefonds and Domaine Koch Dury. And in those days, Koch Dury was hardly known, just beginning to happen. And, you know, it was possible to go and taste there and even uh, he was available still for some markets. And it was only quite a bit later um, that prices started to go up and the whole thing uh, really took off. Um, and even then, for the longest time, Jean-Francois tried to keep his prices down from the domain. And it was only really the secondary market that uh, started accelerating things. Uh, you know, be careful what you wish for, because... Uh, now these things are a little bit out of control in Burgundy. So why did he get this incredible reputation? And it's not particularly because he's got uh, the, best the best placed vineyards. It's still true that the majority of the vineyards are at village level rather than amongst the crews. Um, and then <clears throat> they're in good village vineyards. And uh, it's only more recently that the Grand Cru Corson Charlemagne has arrived and uh, he doesn't have big holdings uh, in the Premier Crews, except perhaps in uh, Marceau Perrier. So I suppose that is the grandest of them. So um, we'll go through a little bit, the a bit more detail, but the real quality I think comes about through his absolutely fanatical, meticulous approach to everything he does. Now, he's not organic in the vineyards. They're not biodynamic. Uh, neither of those things. They do what's called loot raisonne, i.e. they try to minimize sprays and additions and so on. They weren't amongst the first to start plying the vineyards, so they do do that now, and they haven't moved into the sort of the cover crop uh, theory of the uh, some of the cutting edge people of today. But nonetheless, uh, they'd always spend all their time, you could normally only get a tasting in the evenings, uh, because they would spend all their time out in the vines, with real care and attention. And the vineyards always look uh, spectacularly in good condition. So I think the vineyard work is really very important and it's causing anxiety now for uh, Raphael Koch because it's uh, a source of worry as to where exactly where global warming uh, is taking the vines and therefore ultimately the wines of Burgundy. Um, then you come to the cellar and idiosyncratic uh, things going on here in the cellar. 
Um, everything, of course, is handpicked, um, is barrel aged with quite a long aging. So it used to be 12 months in barrel. They would then be racked and then be returned to barrel for depending on the between another six and nine months. So that second winter in wood is important. Uh, they've always quite believed in lee stirring. It's the length of time in barrel plus the lee stirring, which has given the typical costury characteristics of um, those strap match gun flint aromas. Because this is one of several domains, it's not unique. Uh, we have this reductive style of winemaking. Uh, they also used to bottle by hand. Um, and one factor that I, I skipped over a bit too quickly was when they come to press the grapes, for a long time, they maintained the old style mechanical Vaslan press. After years of experimenting, um, renting a press and experimenting, they did buy a pneumatic press as well. So <laughs> But if you use the old style press, it actually, as I said, it's mechanical rather than pneumatic, and it tends to mash up the skins. And so you get something which is um, has more of the polyphenols on the skins involved. And that, again, can give you more of a reductive character uh, in the wines, especially when they're young. Now, they continue with both. They haven't completely switched to the pneumatic side. Uh, but sometimes the pneumatic press is more practical to use. So if from when there have been changes in recent times, maybe we'll we'll come to that uh, in, in discussing the wines. Um, but what we've tried to do today is to find a sensible balance between the vintage of the different wines you've got to and the vineyards. So in an ideal world, we'd go from youngest to oldest, but equally we would go from village level up to Grand Cru, up to Premier Cru and Grand Cru, but we've had to mix them in a little bit because we've got a couple of younger vintages. Um, so I think you're going to be served the first flight. Um, is anything served yet? No? Yep. Yes. Well, so, so you've got four first wines. The 2008 uh, Enseignere, yeah. the 2018 Genevrier, and yeah. then the 2011 and 2014 Merceau Village. Okay. Right, so we begin with the Puligny en Seigneur. So uh, that's uh, apart from the Corton Charmant, it's, uh, I think the only white wine they have outside um, Merceau itself. Um, so it's it's a super vintage en Seigneur. It uh, almost touches, it does touch, in fact, um, Batard Maraché. Um, it's at the southern end, the Chassain Maraché end of Puligny. Um, these vines. Um, I have read that they were um, uh, purchased in the domain in 85 or 86, but the earliest vintage that I remember seeing is 95. Um, and uh, it is, it, it's 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 uh, a strong player in the Costa Rica lineup, even though it's not uh, uh, not from Merceau. A vintage that was a latish harvest, uh, not the best weather, but uh, it was drier with a north wind in uh, late September, which dried everything out and has made quite a concentrated of high acid wines. And alongside that, you've got a wine that's 10 years younger, which is Masso Genevrier, which is the smallest of the Premier Cru holdings that the domain has. Old vines, so, though, planted in 1947. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a vintage, in fact, where Raphael Koch started to use a little bit more new oak. Uh, Raphael, who took off over from his father after 2010, though dad is still very much around, and I'm sure giving advice, um, possibly, I think probably no longer helping in the vineyards, but he certainly continued to work for a few years after his official retirement. So if you'd like to taste those first two, um, and get some ideas on how they're doing. Yes, I mean, 10 years apart, and with the younger one being the premier crew, is going to make a slightly odd um, uh, uh, tasting partnership, if you like. Um, I tasted 2018 uh, with Raphael Koch in spring 2020. And then I said it's fine, light lemon color, beautifully perfumed, little extra sweetness open above the juniper, which I always often find juniper as a tasting component of Genevrea. Or perhaps it's more verbena, which can be characteristics of Genevrea. The 2018 is notably spicy, 
the purest white fruit and great lengths. Ninety-four points for what that's worth. Um, I haven't recently tasted the Pinot Noir Seigneur. Right. So, um, someone want to be spokesman for that pair of wines? Tell me how they're showing. Who's going to volunteer? Well, I think they're both showing well, but the Genevrier is really drinking beautifully, even though it's quite young. And it just seems to be sort of a step up. The uh, Olsenier is, is also quite beautiful, but it doesn't have, to me, like the, the character, as much of the characteristic push that you look for. Yes, I wonder if the fact that it's Pudini makes a difference. Um... Also, of course, with 10 years extra age, then uh, that initial aspect of the, the gun flint will, will reduce. What I found of 2008 originally was that they seemed to uh, have a, a strong concentration of fruit up front. They had high acidity at the back, but they were a little bit, um, there's a little bit of a hole in the middle. And then the question was, would the two halves rather fall apart? Or would the whole wine knit together and cover up the hole in the middle? Um, and on the whole, I'm happy to say, I think uh, that's what's happened. Um, and in many cases, I think 2008 should be in a good place to drink now. And I wouldn't, in general, recommend keeping them for uh, a great deal longer. Uh, this is is likely... your, your, your comment is for all 2008s or for? Yes, no, that, that's a general comment about 2008 whites. Specific, rather than gosh specifically <laughs> and in 2018 again a general comment i think vintage has been slightly undervalued in white um because it was a big crop and because it was a hot year but those two things have slightly cancelled each other out and i fi find the wines are putting on more character as time goes by they're still only babies they're not too high in alcohol um the reds can be but the whites are not because of the size of the crop and actually, I think this is a vintage that's going to show pretty well in the long term. So certainly five and maybe 10 years from now, I think they'll be really getting into their stride. Um, that's my opinion, which is a slight outlier against the uh, general received opinion, which is less favorable for 18 whites. Um, OK, so <laughs> when I first met Chenevriere all those years ago, I didn't think it had quite the same character and punch as uh, uh, as the period. Uh, in more recent years, I think it's it's rather caught up. So your next two wines are village wines, 14 years old. Doesn't really matter which order you, you taste them. And what I'm expecting out of those two is that the 11 should be fully ready to drink. It was a decent white wine vintage without being spectacular. Um, there's a... Um, it seemed to have all the characteristics it should have without developing an immense personality. But now at 10 years on, it should be just about in, in, its, in its best place. Um, and then 2014 is a vintage that we thought was very good when it came out. It's fresh, it's got good acidity, but it's not too aggressive. Excellent fruit. And ever since then, my opinion has only got higher on this vintage as the wines are taking a long, long time to come yeah. around. So I wouldn't be surprised if that wine isn't definitely too young. Uh, anyway, if you'd like to taste those two, and then we'll come back to those. And I've got a few somewhere. I tasted that 2011 Masso not too long ago. OK, <clears throat> so just a reminder, as I'm sure you're all aware, that something labeled Masso um, from Gosturi will not be the same wine in every market because they identify their various different plots separately. They've got Narvo, Viroy, Castet, Luce, Chaume, and you get either one or a blend of them, uh, depending on which importer you are. And it tends to be fairly consistent year in, year out, uh, but it's not put on the label. The importer themselves may know, and you will sometimes see on Seller Tracker that there is one of those vineyards specified as part of it, because presumably whoever owns that bottle uh, received the information from there, but you won't see it on the label.
I have found my tasting note on the um, one of one of one of uh, the regulars at your tastings, who's not with you today, brought a bunch of 2011s into Burgundy last summer, and one of the whites was the Merceau from uh, Costuri. Uh, and my tasting note then um, give it five stars and three points for the village wine. But this is recognizably costury from the telltale gunflint reduction. It's really beautiful as such, and I took time to linger over it. Gorgeous fruit, some citrus, some apple, a well-managed mouthfeel with considerable weight. With oxygen, the fruit came further to the fore and the gunflint retired. Superb length, tasted in July of, of last year. 2014, I don't think I will have tasted uh, any time recently. Jasper, the eleven is drinking. I thought your tasting note was very good on that. The eleven is drinking beautifully at the moment. Good, good, good. good. The, well, I'm a pleased that's drinking beautifully. Be happy that you're drinking it, and C glad that I got my tasting note right. <laughs> yeah. Your tick there. Uh, the fourteen is a. It, it, I think will be the better wine. Uh, but it, it's still quite closed, I think, for me. I, I think it's still lovely, but it's still it's got so much underneath it that you're not picking up because you can see it's still there, um, but it's quite rounded and quite uh, closed for me. Yes, uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, uh, typically I'm finding 2014s to be like that, still very backward, and I'm not looking at any that I've got in my own cellar uh, at all, let alone people of the quality of God. Um, one point I would just make is yes. that I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Uh, so whatever, anybody who wants to speak um, as part of our exchange, then please make sure you use the Bluetooth uh, thing. But otherwise, if the Bluetooth, any other Bluetooth things can be kept uh, not too close to people, uh, maybe in the middle of the table, um, uh, then we won't get uh, the feedback of, of other chatter. This gets um, broadcast subsequently. And it is one of the issues occasionally people tell us is that they get a little bit too much uh, of the feedback. OK, um, so your next two wines or three wines would be what? Yeah, um, 2011 Merceau in Year. Yeah. 2009 Chevalier and then yep. a blind wine. A blind wine after that, which I think might be a little bit darker in colour. Yes. yes. <laughs> dark. Very dark. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, look, I will um, uh, leave you a moment then to to digest those. So, Chenevria, we have already sort of cross-referred it. We've had an earlier Chenevria and we've had a different 2011. So that will be really interesting to see how it shows with those two parameters already on board. Uh, and then I'll talk about Chevalier after that. Okay, so firstly, the Massa Generia 2011. How is that playing out in in uh, in comparison to the other 2011, or indeed the Generia 2018? I I hate to say it, like it's it's good, but I don't think it's that much of a low like you know that many levels higher than like the the large zero level. Okay. <laughs> I don't, I, I just don't, don't feel that way. Is that a general view? I mean, yes. Yeah, okay. I right, well, it'll be interesting if you oh, keep yeah. them in your glass and go back a little bit later on and taste the village and taste the Genevria side by side and just see if the Genevria has come up or whether that's sort of a done deal that there's not that much of an uplift. Um, then we have uh, 2009. Yeah vintage I really like for white burgundy as long as you picked at the right time and Costuri is not a lake picker so they would have picked at the right time uh, and it's Chevalier this lovely vineyard on the hillside uh, where it's getting reasonably steep um, and uh, it, it's sort of you you have this little line of vineyards Tesson then Rougeau um, which is rarely seen um, but Costuri makes the best example um, and we're going to have one tonight. Uh, and then after that, uh, Chevalier. Um, it's a very free draining soil, um, but I find the wines really stylish from Chevalier. 
uh, alongside a vintage, which has got a lot of energy uh, uh, and that should have a lot of depth of fruit. So has the Chevalier, has the Chevalier 09 tasting? Really, really good. Yeah, well, so with, uh, with your, that wine in particular, uh, it's a vineyard I like, a uh, vintage I love, and 12 years out or 13 years out for a, uh, a good village wine that you should be in absolutely perfect prime territory there. I don't know who amongst you whose cellar that came from, but save a bottle for my next visit. <laughs> okay, so this now uh, brings us to your mystery wine. I imagine Scott knows what it is. I know what it is. Michael's not there to tell you what it is. Um, it, it is quite a lot older. Um, so I hope it's held up. I can see that the color is noticeably deeper. Um, one of the reasons it's being said now is I won't be staying with you all the way through all, all of your 15 wines. So, uh, it's come in now, um, so that I could get your comments and, uh, make a steer. Um, it's a vineyard, which is no longer made, it was never made very much. Um, I don't know the origin of the vines, whether they're their own vines or whether they had a farming company. I'm, gu I'm guessing they had a farming contract, um, but it's uh, it hasn't seen around. Um, the last vintage on Seller Tracker is 1999, so you know you're older than that. Is it Koch? It, yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Because fully oh, oxidized. Like, yeah, it's very oxidized. Okay. Well, I mean, it, it could be fully oxidized, but look, this was a minor vintage, um, which um, had a lot of rot in it. It was one of the first years after I started buying professionally, and I, I bought very little whites in this vintage. It's 1981. Um, and... I think, given that it's a bit a bit oxidized, there's no point in trying. Yeah, because that won't really show. So, um, shall I tell you what the vineyard is? Yeah, sure. It is Merceau Premier Cru Charm. Which any any amongst you have drunk the Charm from Costurie before? No, I no. I can't. I why can't remember they, drinking one. Why yeah. did they stop producing? What, what happened to the vineyard? Why did they stop producing? I don't know. So uh, they can't have owned the vineyard. Uh, and I don't think they would have been buying in any grapes in those days. I think they probably had a sharecropping agreement with an owner at one point and later on took it back for their own use. That is an assumption. I don't know that. Either. <laughs> Uh, okay, so maybe what I'll do now um, is just talk through the wines which are still to come in the order I think they're going to be served. Um, and then uh, uh, if you've got any questions, ask me questions and I will leave you to enjoy the rest of your dinner. So what we have still coming up are straight village wines from 05, 02 and 99. And alongside the straight 05, you have the Rougeau 05. This is a video that should be really good, but because there's no really famous person producing it, uh, apart from Costury, um, this Potenay Alpo has it uh, and a couple of other people, but there's quite a big plot that's um, in anonymous hands. And it would be great if somebody smart got hold of that. 05 is a vintage I find quite similar to 09. Um, and uh, I think yeah, that's well known for its reds, quite a sunny year. Uh, but it should be in pretty good nick. 02 I love, it should be totally mature. And 99 Village Merso is, I mean, it's getting old now, it's 23 years old. Um, but I expect it to um, uh, still be around and in uh, 
in good condition, but it will be a, a fully mature wine, I'm assuming. Um, and then where do we go after that? We then go back into the 90s, starting with the Village 99, and we have the two other uh, Premier Crews in white, because of course Costa Rica makes some lovely reds, including a Volnay Premier Crew. Um, and uh, you've got the Cairo in 96, which will be fascinating because that's uh, an awkward vintage, uh, a northeast wind, very sunny, uh, so the sugar levels got there, but the acidity, it was very cold as well, uh, so the acidity never really went down, uh, and as a result, um, sometimes the wines are uh, seem a little bit out of balance. It was a great candidate for the, the horrible premature oxidation uh, as well, but fortunately, uh, most of the wines, all the wines in my cellar at any rate, that um, but oxidized at one point um seem to have come back to life which is a, uh, a great relief um so uh i'm hoping that that will show well tire is an extension it's a little figure added on to the end of volne tire which of course is a red wine vineyard and if you force me to choose i would say that the merso tire probably should be red grapes rather than white after that, you have two vineyards of Perrier. Um, now, uh, the domain has got much more um, Perrier than it used to have. Um, and it's in two parts. Eau Perrier, where the holding is between uh, Domaine Lafont and Davio Perrin, and Perrier, to, uh, the upper part, which is between Chateau and Bouchard. Um, but I think back in the 90s, they only had uh, one of those slices. Um, I think it was probably the Perrier de Sue that they had rather than Eau Perrier. Um, 97 was a year that was has a doesn't really have a reputation in any direction. Nobody talks about it much. It was a sunny year um, where the wines were good, but they lacked the, the, the cachet of, of a really great year. Um, and then um, 93 which was a year that we all thought was a good red wine vintage. We never talked about the whites. And as older, it was the only year in which Jean-Francois Costery decided to join in our 10 year on tastings. And he wine insisted it be uh, decanted okay. beforehand. And it was a star. But nowadays, we are really, really liking 1993 as a white birthday vintage. So I'm hoping that that will, uh, will show well uh, for you when you get there. And the last one is going to be the legendary Corson Chamin 1999, uh, which I have drunk with you in Hong Kong uh, over a, a fabulous sushi meal at somebody in Wan Chai, um, I think it was, uh, um, which I hope that uh, some of you will have been there and will remember that. Um, but it was, it was completely uh, spectacular. Just looking to see if I can um, bring up a tasting note. So alongside the 2002, the 99 offered significantly more depth of flavour, but noticeably less precision at that point. Full on green and gold colour, but still with a pleasing brilliance, mature and accessible nose, generously fruited, outstanding depth. In comparison with the 02, I thought it was perhaps a fraction vulgar. Uh, perhaps that's harsh, as this is clearly a great wine and needs wow. most of the company on the night. But I gave it 98 points, and uh, I think I would have given the... Um, uh, the O2, let's see if I can find my notes on that, just a fraction more. But so you've got mature wine still to come, and I shall expect to report later on. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping that they should all be in good nick. 99 points to the O2. Um, so that we, we pretty much have all the vineyards, um, the main vineyards in white that Costury makes. Obviously, tonight you're not having any of the reds. Um, which is the Volnay Premier Crew I mentioned. There's a very nice village of CDRS. Uh, there used to be a Pomar, but he got rid of that vineyard quite a while ago. Um, and there is, uh, I think there's at least, there's a Bourgogne Rouge and a Montley as well. Uh, and they're really nice, but unfortunately, the effect of costury secondary market pricing on the whites started to take effect in the reds as well, which is not good news for anybody uh, because they were lovely wines at the right price but uh, you can't take them too far. Um, so, um, is there anything out of the tasting so far that you'd like to uh, 
um, come back to me on any questions you'd like to to ask. Uh, hi, Jasper. Two questions. Like one, it's like uh, like uh, it's supposed to be the theme of the tasting. It's like we, we haven't touched on the on uh, the difference between like the style between the father and the son. So. Okay, well, like we people. haven't really got we haven't got enough wines um, uh, from the sun. Uh, I suppose the 2018, 2014, and probably 2011. I don't think there was initially. I think there was no change. Um, there has been something out there in the marketplace of people saying, "Oh, well, the wines are not so good anymore." This can come in part from. Um, when you have a total superstar like Jean-Francois Koch, that maybe people are almost looking for it to be less good when it's not him making the wine. In part, Raphael has made some changes, but he took a little bit longer, um, so the 11s and the 14s wouldn't be in the frame. In the Cote de Bone, 12, 13 and 14 were all uh, very small crops. So he took in 2015 to buy in a few grapes, <laughs> but also in Merceau, and people thought, oh, well, that's going to change everything if they're not growing the grapes themselves. And then in 2016, as a result of the um, hideous frost damage in 2016, he went so far as to buy a lot of grapes from down in the Mapone. So his Bourgogne Blanc of that year, that year only, is made with Macon grapes more than it is with grapes from around Merceau. Since then, he continues to buy some grapes for the Bourgogne Blanc and a little bit for Merceau, but they're really just from vineyards which are located close to where their house is at the upper end of, um, um, sorry, down by the main road um, uh, in Merceau. So that could change things. The introduction of the pneumatic press could make the wines a little bit less um, sort of tightly wound and have a little bit less of the gun flint um, struck match aromas. And one other small change is that they no longer uh, bottle everything from the barrel, so barrel by barrel. Now they have a bottling line, and the bigger cuvées, they will use the bottling line, and the small cuvées, they will still do it um, uh, by hand. So there are changes. I think fundamentally, the wines are recognizably the same. I think perhaps a bit less extreme in the uh, reductive match character. Um, and maybe the 2016s will be a little bit atypical. But in general, I don't think there is a really significant change. Okay. There's a lot of people really like the reductive character and they're complaining about like where it's like the Meredith Gunflin and the matchsticks and, and all the stuff. So that's why like people are saying that, oh, good, yeah, since like uh, Raphael took uh, the baton in 2013, if, if, uh, people are saying that, oh, yeah, yeah. 2011. So it's yeah. not that great after all, especially 13 is a weaker vintage, like for them, right? Yeah, I think 30, 13 is a tricky vintage um, and it's my least favorite white wine vintages. Uh, and it's a softer character anyway. Um, so it may be, I haven't tasted his 13s. Uh, I'm not familiar with them. It may be that they're a little bit down. And it was around that period, 13 through 16, that you heard more of the, the sort of cautious isn't what it used to be uh, 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 discussion. And it is true that the uh, reductive character has been dialed down, as it has also with Pierre-Yves Colin Moray, uh, and probably also with Jean-Marc Rouleau as well. Um, they all decided that they didn't want it to become a caricature of what the wine is around about. Uh, so yes, in your blind tastings, uh, uh, Costa Rica becomes that little bit harder to, uh, to pick maybe. I see. And another question is like, so now the Merceau like got a bit of like the other like, new additions. What would you think that it's the best, uh, like the, um the the best secondary market price like uh we're talking about secondary markets not allocation is like what what's the best the sweet point for kushtari like do you think it's like still the Merceau or the rouge or the rouge or like some other uh, okay um part of the answer to that is that i don't follow the secondary market pricing i find it's <clears throat> and uh anything you guys can do to calm it down without losing uh and your options of getting hold of wines so that would be great um, so, um i don't know what's the premium between uh, a single vineyard like a rougeau 
over the regular Merso. Maybe 30, two, yeah. maybe thirty yeah, percent, something like that. Double, or? Two X. I think it, well, if it's thirty percent, then you go with Rougeau. If it's two X, you probably wouldn't. So <laughs> that's, that's quite a that's quite it's quite a wide range you've uh, you've given me to play with. Um, but um, I mean, I, I'm convinced that until you get up to Perrier, that you necessarily get a sufficient uh, additional uplift for Kyrie and Ginevra, um to make it necessary to hunt after those. If you've got the Merso or Merso plus Liedi or Puligny en Seigneur, then I think you're already in a really good place. Um, Court of Charlemagne, I have to come and see you guys to, uh, to drink that anyway. So. <laughs> um, but happily, it has, it has happened from, from time to time. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, there is a question that you ask every time you have a grower with me, is if you could have another vineyard, what would it be? So if we play with that for Costuri, um, I am going to suggest that uh, I think it would be wonderful if he's going to stay in Merso, then you've got various of the Premier Cruise, or if we were to give him um, one more of the village vineyards, then I'd love to have enough Narvo to make uh, a cuvee of Narvo. Um, he's got he's got a little bit anyway that gets blended in, but if he had a Narvo for a cuvee on its own, I'd quite like to see what he would do with a Premier Cru Punini Morachet. Maybe the one that's next door to Perrier, the Champ Canet, could be fun. Um, or his style of wine, I think, if you were to give him a Grand Cru, another Grand Cru, would be most suited to Chevalier Morachet rather than Batar. Uh, or yeah. Batar. Um, but um, anyway, he's not here to answer himself. Next time I see him, I will, I will ask that question. Um, hey, Jasper, what do you think of the 2021 vintage? in whites uh, in, in general i think it is uh, i'm seeing the merchants are getting hugely enthusiastic about 2021 in both colors i would be a lot more uh, moderate in my in my press um uh, for them i think the reds in the coat de bone are difficult uh, the reds in the coat de nuit are quite good and i'm just writing them up at the moment that will come out at the weekend um but the whites uh is such a small quantity some of the pricing is crazy um I hear that Antoine Chaubar has doubled the price of his Merceau Genevrier. That's now pounds a bottle sort of direct from the from the agent. Um, and there's no justification for prices to go up for with the quality of the 21 whites, but they are, they are good. For the most part, they're good. Um, the acidity can be a little bit too trenchant. Um, you had to make the right picking decisions because you did get a bit of rot later on. But the smart people who you could trust to make the right decisions have made good wines. I haven't tasted Costa Rica 21, though, not yet. So is it a year where like the whites are better than the reds, or are they on, on par? Uh, in the Cote de Bone, it's clearly whites. And I started out thinking the whites are better than the reds. But actually, there are some reds in the Cote de Nuit, which uh, might be uh, a good place to be for the vintage. Uh, the, white, the whites are less good than 2017, um, 14 for sure. They're a different style to 19 or 18. Um, if I went back a bit in whites, maybe 2012 would come into the picture a little bit. Uh, so they're good wines, but they're not going to be especially long lived. Uh, and they're not wines that you absolutely need to have in your cellar. But if you can get from a decent producer at a correct price, then it's worth doing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, look, question like, yeah. for your own page, like, how, long, how long would you like to keep the um, the Corsetary wines, like let's say Merzo or the Rouge, before you open it for yourself? Ha, huh, right. Well, first I do have them in my side. I have a couple. Um, uh, of odd bottles which have turned up in uh, uh, one place or another. I will just, uh, I'm not sure if I still got a couple left, I will just uh, verify that even as we talk. Um, but I think, uh, for example, 2009, um, you had the Chevalier, 2011, you had the Strait, and they're in near perfect places, uh, I, I, I suspect. So 
uh, would definitely be um, in a uh, in a in a in a in a, in a perfect um, twelve years sort of window. Uh, that's what I would have said um, anyway. And now I'm just going to try and see if I can find um, what I may have, um, because. I had the opportunity to buy Costa wines uh, professionally back in 1981, and I, I didn't choose. I have one bottle of 1999 Mercer, which I don't seem to have got around to drinking yet, and I have one bottle of 2008 Mercer. So maybe, uh, maybe next time I need something uh, <laughs> missed out this Christmas and New Year, maybe that 1999 Mercer would be a, would be a good thing to do. Okay. Uh, Jasper, yeah. sorry, it's up all here. Just a very quick question. I'm just curious of your, your comments in relation to 2008. Because um, I've got a few 2008s and I was keeping them, but you seem to suggest that irrespective of the producer um, and well, it's grown crew premier, you would be drinking them right now. Is that? Can you just explain um, a bit? If you've got, so, I, on the whole, yes. Um, uh, it was a period before people had gone to using Diam. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly which wines you've got. If you uh, and if you've got several bottles, and obviously you can you can start drinking them now, and then you can change your mind if it's one that's proving in the glass. But typically, I would be I would be looking to drink them or start drinking them at any rate. Yeah. Okay. Are you more at the village level or Premier Crew or Grand Crew? Uh, a mixture of all three. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't remember tasting the last couple of years um, an 08 where I felt uh, you definitely need to keep it uh, because otherwise you're uh, you're not getting value from it. Uh, so yeah, um, that would be my uh, my view in general. Have you had one recently? Yeah. How's that, Paul? That you felt? Um, no, I really. Only good to see your pat next to me, and that was a couple of years ago. But okay. I haven't got oh, 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 it's recently. Right. I'm just um, having a quick look at my 2008 10 year on tasting. Um, and just to see uh, if I don't think I've done, I didn't do enough of an introduction to that. Um, yeah. Um, no, I, I haven't got anything else really to, uh, and that was four years ago anyway when we tasted them. So no, I, I haven't got any updated information, uh, but I would certainly start looking at them. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for starting the year in uh, fine style with some costury wines. Um, uh, incidentally, I would just mention that I have been saying kosh throughout, and my American friends always tend to say kosh. But uh, here it would be pronounced in Burgundy, it's pronounced with a shorter O as, as Kosh rather than Kosh. Um, but, uh, continue to enjoy. You've got your second flight of seven. You've got food to eat. I've finished my cup of tea. And I will see you. Um, I'm not sure when our next online Zoom will be. As you know, I am hoping to come to Hong Kong in April. And we'll see you all yeah. there. Yeah. See you later. See you later. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. And Bye, guys. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Bye-bye. Yeah. 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 Like, we beat you for the uh, for the aging part. Like we are still on like 2004 for the Christian Merceau and the Hougie. And like you're you're now on 2008. Like, so it's finally we beat you for the aging part. Okay. Good. Good. Well done. Good to see you guys. Bye.